in today's video we are going to be discussing the late Harrison Birtwistle. The focus of this lecture is going to explore Birtwistle's compositional techniques. His work tends to focus on the following. Repetition, temporal related issues, he's also interested in cycles, he's also interested in linear composing, stratification, he also had an interest in the cantus firmus. <laughs> Now let's revisit Carmen Arcadii Mechanicae Perpetuum in light of what we know about Bert Whistle's musical interests and pre-compositional techniques. We've gone over them briefly, haven't we? We've sort of just mentioned them. Let's look at how these techniques are used in the music. This piece involves certain aspects of recurring rhythms throughout the different parts. It explores the extremity of instruments, mainly their registers. So could he have plotted these extremes out first? Could he have said I want this bit to be really high and stretching the extremes of this instrument and then next, next, next bit quite low? Think about it like that. To quote my lecturer when I was an undergraduate student, Bert Whistle is not an extended techniques kind of guy, but he does seem to enjoy exploring the extremities of instruments, even though he sticks within their traditional means of producing the sound. There are also abrupt changes of texture, and this can be compared with the extra musical influence of the mechanical birds. He takes influence from Paul Klee's The Twittering Machine, which depicts mechanical birds. I guess to stop and start like that gives it a mechanical feel in a programmatic kind of way. It sort of mirrors the rhythms of the movement of the birds, doesn't it, if you think about it. Also, Bert Whistle will have a preponderance of particular pitches at particular moments. So he'll focus on, like, say, the pitch E, and they'll have a lot of E, or that pitch will be going on everywhere at this moment, and then it'll change. I guess you could compare that to, like, harmonic language, but he's focusing on one single pitch rather than a chord. But it's just a preponderance, it's not like a complete rule. Preponderance is a good word here. He's also into large-scale repetition. The second page of this piece is an exact repeat of the first page but it's loud the first time and quiet the second time. He might have structured it like so. You have like one and then one B, which is a repeat. One, that'd be it. Fortissimo and one B in piano. Another technique to look at here, hock it. This is a medieval um, and renaissance technique. I think medieval has the edge here though. Basically what a hocket involves is a single continuous line passed between multiple instruments and in this case it's passed between two ensembles. So basically he writes the line first and then decides who will have it. So here's a diagram to demonstrate this. It's my own diagram. I did take it from my lecture notes and I think the lecturer probably wrote this on the board at the time. You have one line which is all these dots and you split it between parts A and B. So A has this then it passes on to B. Still the same line and then it goes back to A. So it's the same kind of melodic line but it's just passed between different instruments. Kind of similar to clang, fab and melody but not quite the same. According to my lecture notes there's also the notion of emphasising certain bits in the hocket. So as a composer I imagine you could do this through the piece's texture, doubling instruments or reducing the accompanying texture and so on at certain parts. So if you want to emphasise a certain part of the melody, maybe you double it at that one part to add emphasis, um, maybe you reduce the texture around it to make it stand out more. But anyway, in my lecture notes I've written that Bert Whistle creates something that's effectively like stereo and sometimes there will be two separate types of material that are alternated. Ah, we're going to go into more detail about this now. So in this piece, Carmen Arcadia Mechanicae Perpetuum, Carmen Arcadiae Mechanicae Perpetuum, in this piece there seems to be a fight between two opposing ways of treating compositional material. The piece is both deliberately chaotic and also deliberately mechanical. Also, Bert Whistle seems to try to establish a temporal aim or purposeful direction in his music. And this can be compared with a cadence point in classical music, for instance. Yet at the same time, he's also fascinated by isorhythms. Now, for more information about isorhythms, see my Messian lecture. Basically, isorhythms can be used to create a sense that time has stopped, and I explain specifically how you can do that in this Messian lecture. So there's a sense of stopping and starting overall, and this constantly usurps the listener's expectations. Although the more it happens, I guess, the less it usurps the listener's expectations, because you just get used to the piece of being like that. 
So there's an apparent struggle between musical instruments in this piece because they're all sort of fighting for the same part. Nevertheless, there's an aim towards a rhythmic unison towards the end of the piece. When I studied this as an undergraduate, my lecturer said that he couldn't decide if the instruments have got stuck in a loop. So have a listen for this perspective. I can see what he means. There seems to be this battle between something cyclic and something linear, or at least the piece as a whole employs elements of stratification that gives this an element of linearity in the sense that the lines are still treated as lines. Let me know what you think about that. So, how does Bert Whistle structure all this different compositional material? Like the isorhythmic material and the hocket material. How does he structure all that to create a sense of stopping and starting? Well, I did touch on this literally just briefly a minute ago, um, where I talked about how he alternates between different ways of treating material. In this piece, there seems to be a fight between two opposing ways of treating compositional material. So we're going to look at that in more detail. Here is an example of a logical sequence Bert Whistle might, or maybe he did, employ. And this is taken from my undergraduate lecture notes. So here we have a table. And in this table, you will have, so you've got the material A, B, C, D, E, and that's just isorhythm material. And you've also got other material, V, W, X, Y, Z, and that's just hocket material. Now he writes them out separately. So he'll write his isorhythm material, he'll write his hocket material. And then he puts them together, but he intersperses them. So he'll take the A, the isorhythm, and he'll take a, a hocket, a bit of hocket material, and that'll be V. Then he'll go back to B, a bit of isorhythm material, a bit of hocket material for W. Then he might go more isorhythm material, C. He might stick with isorhythm material, D, because he doesn't want it to become too predictable and merely have them alternating. Um, then we go to X and Y, hocket material, E, back to some isorhythm material, and then back to some hocket material for Z. He's usurping the listener's expectations in what's going on because once a particular technique or treatment of material is established, like an isorhythm, it's changed abruptly to something else, like a hocket. And that's the thing, it's changed abruptly. It's not like there's any foreshadowing or any blending, it's just next section or next bit of treatment of material. And I think that gives it the mechanical feel. <sighs> to be honest, listening to the piece, you don't really specifically hear the different techniques unless you know what to listen for. But this overall way of structuring material does give an overall sense of something mechanical and jerky. So have a listen. So it works for this overall feel of the music that you wouldn't get if you'd done something different. But specifically, are you going on that intense journey with him and then changing and knowing what's going on? I don't know. It's dialectical, it's both, it's both this and that. <laughs> now let's look at the Cantus Firmus in Secret Theatre. Ostinatos which are interlocked in different ways. When does ostinato cease to be as such? And the important thing to consider at this point is the function. Apparently, Bert Whistle has a series of little number games that he plays in order to generate material, especially pitch. Here we have the wedge. Because <laughs> we have we done a little bit of a whistle top store. Whistle top 